It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dan Lee, uh, who is Associate uh, Professor of Otolaryngology at uh, um, Harvard Medical School in Massachusetts General, um, or Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. And he's the Director of Pediatric Otology and Neurotology, and also the Director of the Fellowship Program there at MGH. So Dan, thank you for joining us for this lecture series. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say about uh, ear surgery. Great. Uh, thanks, Bill, again, for the invitation and all as well to Ann Maxwell uh, for the opportunity to sort of be part of this really exciting lecture series for fellows through the house clinic. Um, the title of my presentation uh, today is Heads Up Ear Surgery, uh, the Role of Endoscopes and Exoscopes in the Era of COVID-19. And so with that, these are my financial disclosures of which 3NT Medical does now uh, market a technology that is involved with heads up transcanal ear surgery, uh, but I will not be mentioning this technology in any point during any of the slides uh, this morning. That's 3NT Medical. So. so let's talk about heads down versus heads up surgery. So if microscopic otolotic surgery is heads down surgery, the surgeon's looking down through the oculars uh, using a line of sight approach for surgical illumination and magnification, the approach that we've all trained with Heads up surgery is when the surgeon's head is positioned up and looking forward. And really heads up technologies were developed in the 1940s during the end of World War II. And this concept really originated in the military aviation space, literally in the 1940s and 50s, where they developed these very early uh, examples of heads up displays or HUDs. And one of the first examples was this gyro reflector gun sight, which was retrofitted uh, to uh, the Supermarine Spitfire, this beautiful aircraft, one of my most favorite military aircraft from World War II, a British single engine aircraft with this uh, incredibly uh, well-designed uh, fuselage and um, uh, was very uh, important towards uh, the uh, victory in the airs against the Germans during World War II. And so these aircraft were fitted with these gun sights, which allowed the pilots to perform heads up, lining up of their guns uh, during, uh, during combat without having to look down. And they were able to adjust uh, the gun sight based upon the, the width of the wingspan, as well as uh, the gun sight provided a prediction of the trajectory of the bullet based upon uh, the flight of the plane. And so this was some of the first examples of heads up displays or heads up technology that uh, enabled users, in this case pilots, to be able to be more successful and uh, more precise uh, with their maneuvers. Heads up displays obviously are used universally now in the aviation industry and are now being used, of course, in cars as well. These were first introduced um, in automobiles uh, by General Motors in the late 80s and can be found in some cars today to be able to look up and drive and be able to see the speed limit and even navigate as well to try to reduce uh, pilot or driver error. Um, and so what about heads up surgery in otology and neurotology? And so we're talking about two different approaches, endoscopes for small surgical corridors, transcanal middle ear surgery, or canal up transmastoid dissection using endoscopes, rigid telescopes, Hopkins rod telescopes, or exoscopes for open surgical corridors, be it cochlear implant surgery, canal down mastoidectomy, or craniotomy. These are extracorporeal or digital microscopes that are used in place of a traditional microscope to be able to provide surgical illumination as well as magnification when operating off of a screen in front of the surgeon. But don't forget that exoscopes can also be applied for transcanal cases as well. So if you're doing a, a speculum assisted transcanal, for example, tympanoplasty or stapedectomy, this could also be performed with an exoscope uh, as well as an endoscope. So well, let's first talk about endoscopes and otology and neurotology and start with terminology. And so if otoendoscopy is the use of rigid endoscopes to examine the ear, endoscopic ear surgery is the use of rigid endoscopes to perform ear surgery. And this has been applied now to a variety of otologic and lateral skull base approaches uh, in our field. TEAS or transcanal endoscopic ear surgery is self-explanatory and transmastoid endoscopic ear surgery is the application of a rigid endoscope 
that is applied through the mastoid surgical corridor to be able to access chronic ear disease that you could not see or reach through a trans canal approach. And so this is a, a commonly used approach that I use in my practice to manage advanced chronic ear disease in which a mastoidectomy canal up is needed. And it certainly has reduced the number of canal wall down mastoidectomies that I perform in our practice for cases of extensive cholesteatoma. Moving on to a brief history of endoscopes in otology. And this is really a revised history based upon some recent uh, research that was done by uh, Dr. Cozen and colleagues here in Boston. Uh, we found a paper from Lorngoscope from 1950 authored by no other than Georg Bekeshi, uh, writing from Cambridge, Massachusetts, so where he was at Harvard University. And prior to that, uh, as everyone knows, uh, was originally from Hungary and uh, worked uh, in a post office uh, in telecommunications. And in the study, he was applying the use of a very simple early prototype of an end otoscope for examining the middle ear to be able to determine stapes mobility. And that was in 1950. And of course, all of you know that in 1961, he did win the Nobel Prize for his seminal work on um, providing us with information about the middle ear and inner ear mechanics. And his talk in Stockholm was concerning the pleasures of observing mechanics of uh, the inner ear. That was Georg Bekeshi, really one of the first to describe the use of an otoendoscope uh, for use in examining the middle ear. A brilliant individual. Fast forward about a decade or more, uh, Bruce Murr's work in the uh, 60s in Chicago. And this was a photograph that we unearthed uh, that is now part of a paper that is uh, currently under review in which Dr. Murr is using a very early prototype of an otoendoscope for examining the right ear of a patient um, who's uh, lying here in the gurney. 1982, fast forward um, uh, over a decade or so to Japan, Nomura and colleagues in the White Journal published the feasibility study of using a needle otoscope for examining the middle ear anatomy. But again, the imaging was pretty crude based on limitations and video technology of that day. Fast forward to 1995, Dr. Poe hosted the first course in otoendoscopy for otology and neurotology. And this is uh, when we begin to see some improvements in video technology to be able to appreciate the middle ear anatomy using a uh, rigid uh, endoscope. And I think all of us would regard Dr. Terabishi as really the father of endoscopic ear surgery. He quietly worked on his craft for a number of years with many naysayers uh, in our field and uh, slowly developed a core group of colleagues globally that began to uh, manage their patients uh, with chronic ear disease using a purely transcanal uh, endoscopic approach. And it was this paper in 1997 entitled Endoscopic Management of Acquired Cholesteatoma, in which he described the first uh, cases of acquired disease successfully managed with a transcanal endoscopic approach. So I met uh, Dr. Terabishi probably five years before I even started doing my first endoscopic cases in Boston. And um, I was impressed by his presentations of the quality of uh, the imaging and the detail of the middle ear anatomy, but I had zero interest in uh, switching over to an endoscope. I thought I was a reasonably uh, decent, safe chronic ear surgeon with a microscope. There was no reason why I wanted to ever change, but uh, Five years later, he helped uh, to, uh, our, us to host a um, endoscopic ear course here in the States uh, with my friend Tony Mikulik in St. Louis. And uh, about a month or two after that course, I booked uh, a left ear transcanal procedure. And uh, my first transcanal cholesterol surgery was performed with uh, the esteemed Dan Roberts, a former Harvard resident, a former house ear fellow, and is now a very successful UConn surgical faculty member uh, here in Hartford, Connecticut. And so I'm very proud of all of Dan's accomplishments. And uh, I uh, look uh, back at my time with Dr. Roberts fondly during his time as my chief resident as we began our first forays in endoscopic ear surgery. And indeed, this is a uh, attic cholesteatoma transcanal in a left ear, which is a slightly easier ear to start with when you're beginning transcanal endoscopic ear surgery. And so here's Dr. Roberts dissecting an attic cholesteatoma. Uh, from a left ear transcanal using uh, the endoscope. And that was in 2012. So why did I end up switching? Well, 
the monocular microscope does provide a somewhat limited view of the middle ear and transcanal cases can be challenging if the canal is small and or torturous, especially in pediatric uh, cases of uh, cholesteatoma. Extensive bone removal oftentimes is needed to be able to access complex middle ear disease that extends beyond a line of sight approach. And of course, teaching residents to perform a transcanal case can be challenging because the sidearm never affords the attending surgeon the same view that the surgeon or operator is enjoying through the binoculars of the microscope. Whereas with a heads up approach, everyone in the room gets to enjoy the same view. And so an example from my practice, a transcanal right ear case, we've elevated the drum, superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior. This patient has right-sided conductive hearing loss. And so what is the diagnosis here? So in microscopic view, we see this patient has a long process of the incus erosion, a spontaneous erosion of the long process of incus. And so with a microscope, you can make the diagnosis, make the call and do the right thing and perform an aciculoplasty of some sort. However, when we switched over to the endoscope just a few seconds later in the same case, we see the same anatomy, but in a much, much different way. It's a, it's a greater depth of field, a wider angle view, and you really begin to appreciate the nuances of the pathology in this patient with an eroded long process of incus. We can now see Unlike the microscopic view, uh, most of the middle ear, including the cochleiform process, the facial nerve, the body of the incus, the entire oval window niche, we can now see much of the round window niche itself, the subcochlear air cell system, and the entire cochlea. And so this is a very different view to be able to appreciate the same pathology. And so from a teaching perspective, I think it's, it's really tough uh, to beat. And from a surgical perspective, it's just a lot of fun to be able to enjoy a view of this quality. Let's go over some basics of endoscopic ear anatomy. And this is a right ear transcanal tympanotomy from our practice. This is gonna be anterior and superior. This individual has a right-sided conductive hearing loss, long process of incus, tympanic segment of facial nerve, the stapes superstructure, the incutostopedial joint, the stapedial tendon, the cochleiform process, the round window niche, which has a partial pseudomembrane seen here, the round window overhang or tectum or tegmen, the cochlear promontory, the sinus tympani, that elusive space that oftentimes escapes detection even in canal wall down cases, is easily seen with an endoscope transcanal, the posterior pillar of the round window niche, and the anterior pillar of the round window niche, both important areas to saucerize during cochlear implant surgery via the round window approach. And the funiculus, which is a bridge of bone between the cochlear promontory and the hypotympanic air cells. I found that this patient happens to have a patch of otosclerosis and underwent uneventful transcanal stapedectomy. Same case now looking anterior and superior with an angled endoscope showing the cochleiform process, the tensor tympani tendon, and the cog. The cog is really a stalactite of bone, right? It's, um, it emerges from the uh, attic and it really divides or partitions the spaces defined by the supertubal recess as well as the anterior attic. Left ear transcanal endoscopic view, we're using an angled endoscope to be able to appreciate the hypotopanic spaces. And so this is the left ear, superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior, showing the stapedial tendon, the facial nerve, and the undersurface of the manubrium, the tympanic membrane undersurface, the funiculus, again, that spans the, the gap between the um, anterior pillar of the round window niche to the hypotympanic air cells, the subcochlear canaliculus, which is an air cell system which tracks from the middle ear towards the petrous apex, and the fustus. The fustus is a fantastic surgical landmark for otologists. Why? Because the fustus is coplanar with the floor of the scala tympani. And so if you're dealing with an anomalous 
inner ear anatomy case, and you're trying to hunt down the round window niche, or in the case that we did yesterday, which was an X-linked deafness child with an X-linked deafness deformity, uh, we were able to identify the fustus without fail and identify a spot for a cochleostomy for a very lateral insertion and approach of the array to reduce the risk of placement of the electrode array into the internal auditory canal. So the FUSTA is extremely helpful, especially in anomalous cases. I never heard about the structure uh, during my training, even though John Aparco, uh, my main surgical mentor, wrote a paper on it when he was at Michigan. Uh, we didn't really see it very well anyways with the microscope, but with the endoscope, you can really appreciate the anatomy uh, case after case. The FUSTA is a great landmark for cochlear implant surgeons. The subiculum and the ponticulus. These are two bony ridges which help to frame the sinus uh, tympani. The ponticulus means bridge and it really spans the distance between the pyramid and the promontory of the cochlea. This case has a fairly uh, underdeveloped ponticulus. So ponticulus, subiculum, sinus tympani. And this was seen with a 30 degree endoscope looking backwards in this left middle ear. Another view of a left ear using an angled endoscope showing the sinus tympani, ponticulus, in this case, very well developed between the pyramid and the promontory of the cochlea, and the subiculum. Another view, left ear transcanal, superior inferior, showing the incus and the stapes, the round window niche, the fustus again, and the funiculus. So again, the fustus is coplanar with the floor of the scale of tympani. And so if you have time in the lab to dissect this, uh, when you find the fustus, track your drill forward and, you'll, and you will enter directly the floor of your scale of tympani. A view not oftentimes achieved with a microscopic approach, but with a transcanal approach using a 45 degree endoscope, a pretty easy view to be able to achieve. And there are some chronic cases where disease can crawl in uh, to the eustachian tube. So this is the internal carotid artery, the eustachian tube proper, and the semi-canal of the tensor tympani uh, muscle, and of course the cochlea. A really great view which uh, does not require uh, much soft tissue exposure and minimal to no additional bony removal to be able to achieve in most cases. This is an interesting case from my practice. A 10-year-old presented with a right-sided uh, ear bone gap on threshold testing. And uh, to the group, any thoughts on what the deformity is here? So this is a right ear. This is superior. I'm sorry, this is going to be anterior and posterior, superior and inferior. And what is the deformity in this 10-year-old with right-sided conductive hearing loss? Any thoughts and you can please use the chat function on Zoom if you'd like. So this uh, child has a conductive hearing loss when we palpated the incus uh, from likely stapes fixation. The stapes was immobile at the level of the foot plate. Someone mentions OI, probably not in this case, but this is stapes fixation. So it uh, does resemble the fixation seen in some cases of OI. So what you see here actually, the deformity really is the absence of the pyramid and the tendon. This child has an isolated agenesis of the pyramid and the stapedial tendon and likely the muscle as well. So this is the incus, the stapes, which is actually normally formed if you look at it from uh, different angles, the tympanic facial nerve. We see the beautiful foot plate is shown here. The stapes was fixed, the malleus and incus were mobile. Cochlea, sinus tympani, there's no ponticulus, right? Because there is absence of the pyramidal process and you see no tendon as well. And so this patient underwent an uneventful transcanal uh, stapedectomy. So a very interesting case of agenesis of the pyramid and tendon in a 10 year old with isolated ear bone gap on the right side, otherwise healthy, no other issues. So facial nerve, incus, stapes, superstructure, posterior cruce, and the cochlear promontory and round window niche. And this, of course, is your fustus. And finally, your sinus tympani. Another view from the same case, a really beautiful vantage point from which you can appreciate the round window anatomy. The round window membrane proper is visualized behind the pseudomembrane. 
the posterior pillar, anterior pillar of the round window niche, and of course, our fustus. The endoscopes are really fantastic, especially for pediatric uh, ear disease. And so this is a one and a half year old presented uh, with uh, the concern by the pediatrician of a possible white mass of uh, the middle ear. And so this patient was diagnosed with a congenital cholesteatoma. And just wanna briefly review this case with you to highlight what is possible with a transcanal endoscopic approach. This was a case that likely I would have done posterior, given the fact that these uh, cholesteatomas tend to arise more anteriorly. And so it's difficult to be able to see far forward without creating a more posterior line of sight vantage point from which you can then dissect disease. Certainly small ones can still be taken transcanal microscopically, but larger ones can be a little bit more tricky. And the endoscope just makes it so much easier. So um, elevating the flap and exposing the middle ear, identifying the ossicles. Again, this is left ear. So this is your corda tympani, incus, tendon, cochlea, scutum, incus, stapes, facial nerve, the back end of our cholesteatoma. A key maneuver is to glove in the malleus, a technique that I never learned in training at all, but I use routinely in endoscopic procedures where I remove a portion, if not the entire drum from the malleus, and that gives you great access to the anterior compartments of the mesotopanic space. In this case, we end up removing entirely the drum from the underlying malleus to be able to freely mobilize the disease process and then remove it with an angled dissector. So in my practice, I think that transcanal endoscopic procedures are really ideal for congenital cholesteatomas, uh, anterior central perforations, deep retraction pockets are fantastic with the endoscope. I used to always have to do those postericular, and in many cases I can do these transcanal because I can really see around the corners and clear out all the retained retracted keratin and skin, as well as of course the classic indication, attic cholesteatoma. What about transmastoid endoscopy? Well, don't forget that the endoscope is a really great tool for looking through the mastoid. And so after doing a canal up mastoid dissection to clear out extensive chronic ear disease, I then place a, a moist sponge as a bumper to stabilize the scope. I then introduce the scope into the middle ear through the additus sinantrum to be able to look down towards the mesotopanic space to clear any disease I could not clear through a transcanal approach. And so this is a left ear. And after we've completed a canal while up master dissection, we've introduced our rigid telescope. We have to stabilize it with the sponge. Don't lie it on the bone. It's gonna move back and forth and it will be a very unsatisfying experience. I, trust me, I have experienced that. And so this is again, a left ear view through the mastoid with a 45 degree endoscope looking down towards the middle ear. And so this is superior, inferior, lateral and medial. And this will be anterior shown here. So based upon uh, those coordinates, the structures should be the Any thoughts there? It's a confusing image to visualize if you've never seen this view before. But in this left ear, this is the stapes, the cochleiform process, the tensor tympani tendon, and of course, the cog. And you see the eustachian tube in the distance. And relative to the cochleiform process, we see tympanic facial nerve. We see a hint of the ampullated end of the horizontal semicircular canal and the cochlear promontory also in the distance more inferior. And so stapes, tendon, cog, cochleiform process. This is the view you get with a transmaster dissection looking down the middle ear through the attitus at antrum and through the attic. And so this gives you an opportunity to remove residual disease that is sometimes impossible to see with a transcanal approach, even with all of your fancy angled endoscopes. So it's been a really great tool in, in my practice to reduce the indication for canal wall down mastodectomy, especially for primary disease, which is quite extensive and goes beyond the limits of the attic. What about in neurotology? Well, I use endoscopes fairly routinely, uh, especially in middle fossil craniotomies for SCD repair to look around corners, to be able to use a smaller cranial window, to be able to clear areas in which the dehiscence is on a downslope 
or in situations uh, where this, the skull base itself really makes it difficult for a line of sight approach without really enlarging your craniotomy and, and performing a lot of extensive brain retraction. Endoscopic assisted retrosegment retro craniotomies uh, I've done as well for tumor removal and plugging of air cells. I can recall an extensive NF2 schwannoma case where the disease was really far beyond what we could see with the microscope after decompressing the IC and the endoscope was really helpful to be able to look around corners and clear out schwannoma that we could not visualize using a line of sight approach. Endoscopic assisted transmaster dissection is also very helpful for looking around corners because your corridor obviously is gonna be smaller in those cases. And of course, I also use the endoscope for helping to confirm appropriate placement of the array. And in some cases, if I can't really appreciate the recess well, we'll go back in endoscopically after using the microscope to be able to nudge the array in further to be able to ensure proper placement during surgery. And hopefully that correlates with appropriate EABR responses. This is an example uh, from our practice, a right ear pediatric ABI procedure done via retrosegment craniotomy. And this was a child with cochlear aplasia, but a relatively well-preserved vestibular end organ system. And so we used a 30 degree endoscope following microscopic dissection to be able to visualize the CP angle. Here is the cerebellum. Again, this is a right ear. We see the eighth nerve, which is likely mostly vestibular fibers, the seventh nerve, the sixth nerve, the ninth nerve and the 10th nerve. And of course the ABI is placed in the area of the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle and its landmarks include the choroid plexus of which you can see a tuft of that here. And so really you follow the base, the root entry zone of the ninth cranial nerve down to the brainstem. You find the tuft of choroid plexus and that's where you dissect bluntly and hopefully place successfully your surface ABI array. And of course here is your vertebral uh, artery. Question from uh, Deepa Galea from Baltimore, Deepa. Uh, nice to hear from you, hope all is well at, at Hopkins. Can you discuss your approach to second look procedures for cholesteatoma now that endoscopes are available? So I now routinely, not routinely, but oftentimes do second look procedures more often than I did before using endoscopes in my uh, practice. So the number of second look procedures has increased. The number of mastoidectomies, canal up and canal down have significantly decreased. And so as far as training exposure in our practice, they don't get as, our residents don't get as much exposure with canal wall down dissection for chronic ear disease, but we're doing many more second books. What is another advantage of heads up surgery versus uh, the microscope? Well, ergonomics, no question are superior with endoscopes and exoscopes over the microscope. So these are some of the slides that I took from Dr. Nauman and Dr. Siegel's wonderful presentation on ergonomics at the Academy. So thank you, Ilka and uh, Noah for these slides. Surgeons work hard. On average, up to 2,500 hours per year and a third of those hours are spent in our favorite workspace, the operating room. And this unfortunately has a negative impact on the musculoskeletal system. And up to three quarters of otolaryngologists responding to a number of survey studies report pain or discomfort due to work. And although our operative environment has been extensively studied to prevent patient injury, it's really been poorly understood from a surgeon safety uh, perspective. And so what's the goal of improving ergonomics? Really the goal is to reduce human error, increase productivity and enhance safety and comfort. And this is a great example that highlights some of the challenges of how patient morphology can influence the ergonomics for the surgeon, a very, very challenging case. Think about it, you're a right-handed surgeon. This patient has a chronic ear involving the middle ear exclusively. You wanna do a transcanal procedure with a microscope, extremely challenging. What is this patient's diagnosis? So essentially no neck, huge shoulders. This patient has clipophile syndrome and clipophile patients have congenital cervical fusion. However, anatomic limitations, even as challenging as this can be overcome with the use of an endoscope. And so she underwent an uneventful transcanal dissection of her addict cholesteatoma, even with a right-handed surgeon, 
we could still overcome the issues of her shoulder because we had a little bit more latitude and movement with the endoscope compared to having to use a speculum or speculum holder and a traditional binocular microscope. How about improving ergonomics with the microscope that we already have? Is that possible? It certainly could be. And so one of our colleagues in the UK, Matthew Young, a wonderful individual who has a background in ergonomics, uh, developed this novel modification of his surgical chair. And so the chair he uses backwards, and so the backrest becomes the chest rest, and then he creates this stabilizing bar with a pad that holds the forehead in place. So it allows the neck to relax more during trans uh, microscopic procedures. And so he calls this the postural, the prototype postural support chair. So this is certainly one way forward if we want to try to enhance ergonomics when using a microscope to be able to take pressure off the back and the shoulders and the neck. What about exoscopes? My first experience with an exoscope actually was in Seattle, Washington, at Doug Backus's uh, SOARS course about four years ago. I was here with uh, Alex uh, uh, Huber, and we were dissecting for the first time uh, with an exoscope. This was a first generation robotic arm assisted digital microscope developed in Canada, and it's really fantastic, beautiful, immersive, wide field view. It was a 2D camera, but uh, we didn't really miss the 3D experience very much. And it really provided a uh, unique experience to use a digital microscope for the first time. And so we were performing cochlear impact procedures. As well, Dr. Bax, I believe, has done a number of exoscopic CIs in Seattle um, with a digital microscope. So based upon that early experience, we trialed a number of systems in Boston and published our experience in a paper in the White Journal uh, last year, entitled an initial experience with a three-dimensional exoscope-assisted transmastoid and skull base surgery. And so to again briefly over, to briefly review the different uh, surgical options for visualization, of course, we have our microscope, which has about a 20 to 50 centimeter focal distance and has a line of sight approach. The 2D endoscope, which is a one to three centimeter focal distance. So you need to bring the scope lens very close to the target tissues. So it's not great for drilling, but it's really good for, for fine dissection of the middle ear structures. And it's visualized obviously through a heads up HD or 4K monitor system. And finally, a 3D exoscope is really a replacement for the microscope. It has the same focal distance or similar focal distance as the microscope and you visualize it through a heads up display, either via HD or 4K, and some are 2D and some are 3D approaches. These exoscopes have several common uh, features and three different types are shown here in the slide. There's a 3D HD or 4K video camera, a high intensity light source, a camera holder and an arm, and a foot or hand controller as well. A 3D video panel or a 2D video panel can be used to visualize your dissection. And 3D glassers for the users if you happen to have a 3D video system on. And so this is an example of uh, my chief resident doing a transmaster dissection for a cochlear implant using one of the exoscope systems that we were demoing in Boston. We haven't committed to one yet. And Dr. Kozen, now our second year fellow in neurotology doing a transmaster dissection for cochlear implantation again, using a different type of 3D exoscope with 3D glasses. We summarized our experience with 11 exoscopic uh, cases with uh, no significant surgical complications. We did four canal up mastoidectomies, three canal wall down mastoidectomies, one posterior tympanoplasty, one subtotal putrosectomy, and two suboccipital craniotomies for tumor. And this is a qualitative survey study, but to summarize, uh, we showed that at least in this early experience with a limited number of cases that the exoscope showed a lack of neck strain and fatigue compared to the microscopic dissection. As shown by this bar graph. Image quality, however, favored the operating microscope and that's no surprise to anybody. So initial impressions, Exoscope versus microscope, advantages of the exoscope, compact camera unit, better ergonomics, less neck strain, no question, a better immersive video experience, better for teaching, better for your staff to be able to appreciate and follow the case. 
disadvantages, inadequate lighting in narrow spaces, no question. When we get to very, very narrow and tight spaces, for example, the facial recess in middle ear, things can look somewhat dark and granular. So the technology certainly is getting better year after year, but it hasn't quite achieved what you can get with a, tradi a traditional ground glass lens microscope. And so the image quality is not quite there, but I think it's, it's good enough for most applications. The video system can be challenging in small operating rooms because of the footprint of the largest screens that are being used. And finally, 3D experience is not really for everyone. And I'll tell you that <clears throat> in dissecting, for example, tumor off of the facial nerve, I go back to the 2D view because I think that, that the two-dimensional view gives me a much higher resolution view with less granularity to do the most important parts of the case, whether it's placing the implant array in, removing tumor from the facial nerve or from the ossicular chain, I think that the um, 2D view is still better than the 3D view. I think with the advent of 8K and 16K video technology, we may be able to harness the advantages of higher numbers of pixels to be able to improve the resolution of a three-dimensional digital video image. So what about the role of Heads up ears heard during a pandemic to go back to the title of this presentation. And so it's obviously a topic that much of the field and the world certainly has been thinking about. How do we uh, follow and how do we mitigate risk uh, during this very challenging time for all of us? And I wanna start by talking about how the pandemic has influenced my own photologic practice here in Boston. And so uh, during the week of um, March 16, uh, here in Boston, our institution asked the providers to significantly reduce the clinical schedule. And so that week in March, mid-March, I saw 21 patients in the office. Normally, I see more than 80 patients per week. I performed eight elective procedures, and normally I do about eight to 12 cases per week, depending on, uh, on the week. On March 20th, I did perform a semi-urgent chronic ear, and the rest of the the month I saw no patients in the office, nor did I do any additional procedures. All the cases and patients were canceled for the month of March. In the month of April, I did a total of four in-person office visits. I did 24 telemedicine visits, that's 24 more than I've ever done in my entire career up until April of this year. I performed one surgical procedure. This was in April, an emergency incision and drainage of a neck abscess secondary to skull-based osteomyelitis. In uh, the month of May, I performed 17 in-person office visits. I performed 28 telemedicine visits. I did three operations, one craniotomy for a tumor with impending cranial nerve deficits, one craniotomy for a CSF leak, and one transcanal middle ear biopsy to rule out malignancy. So I did three procedures in May and one in April. So the practice essentially was shut down except for very urgent cases in the office and uh, surgically. Our institution initiated the phase one transition post the surge on June 1st, so just recently, a few days ago. We are seeing no more than eight patients per clinic session, so no more than eight patients per half-day clinic, although we can only have a half-day clinic per provider in otology because of space constraints. We have one attending in each clinic pod uh, per half a clinic session. So no more than eight patients per clinic session, so essentially 30 minutes per visit, and we're only seeing semi-urgent cases booked in the operating room uh, so far. So since April, I've not performed any flexible fiber optic examinations on my patients in the office. I've used a barrier drape, uh, we call it an odotent for all my mastoid and craniotomy cases. In fact, we use an odotent to be able to isolate the incision and drainage of the neck abscess case as well. This was a, a very lovely individual that we've known for a long time, whose wife unfortunately succumbed to COVID-19 a week before his surgery. And so we also used a barrier shield drape during his procedure and use an exoscope to visualize the neck to be able to complete the incision and drainage. And I've used a basic 2D exoscope that we've had in our practice for probably a decade for all of my cases, except for an excellent deafness cochlear implant that I performed yesterday, in which we used a microscope with a barrier drape to isolate some of the dispersion of surgical debris. 
And so should autologists be worried? Certainly in the absence of great data, uh, there are some lines of evidence that suggest that we should certainly be concerned. We know that there's a viral load of COVID-19 in the nasopharynx. That's clearly been established. There's an establishment clearly that there's a connection anatomically of nasopharynx to the middle ear. And a number of papers have supported evidence that there are coronaviruses that can be isolated from fluid in the middle ear as well as the nasopharynx. Studies have been done in the past that indicate the potential of mastoidectomy as an aerosol generating procedure or AGP as it's more commonly known. So unlike other AGPs, however, mastoidectomies can go on as we all know for 30 minutes or hours at a time during extensive bony dissection with powered instrumentation. And so in a paper published about nine years ago in ONN by Norris and colleagues, he looked at the assessment of air quality during mastoidectomy. And this was a dissection study performed on cadaveric temporal bones. And they measured basically particulate concentration between mannequins positioned near the surgical field, the standard mask versus a respiratory mask, N95 or an FFP2 mask. And so to get to the punchline, the surgical respirator N95 decreased particulate exposure in this mannequin study when dissecting on cadaveric temporal bones. Based on these lines of evidence and others, uh, we put together a guide uh, through the ANS AOS as well as the Academy to be able to provide some information to our colleagues in otology and neurotology to be able to uh, mitigate risk. And this was a paper that's currently under revision right now. And I want to acknowledge uh, the senior, or the, rather the first author, uh, authors, Dr. Kozen and Dr. Remenschneider for their significant contributions and the multiple revisions that they've had to perform uh, to be able to address a lot of great feedback uh, to get this paper to where it is uh, today. And much of this text actually has already been published online through the Academy website. And so in this paper, we talked about risk mitigation and some of our colleagues have sought creative ways to do this. And so these are photographs that were provided kindly by our colleagues in California, Dr. Brody, Dr. Diaz, and Dr. Sagev at UC Davis. They're using a full papra hood as well as a microscope to perform mastoidectomy surgery during the pandemic. And they've also created this really nice tent to be able to reduce some of the dispersion of surgical debris during mastoid dissection. And so although a papra hood is very difficult to use, especially with a microscope, as well as difficult to hear because of the noise of the fan, you can use a papra to some limited degree with the microscope and the tent provides additional protection as well. However, using an exoscope might be an easier way forward, especially when using full PPE. And so this is uh, photographs taken in Modena, Italy. Uh, or this could be in Verona, Italy, actually, by Dr. Daniele Marchioni, my friend and colleague. And he's doing a transmastoid dissection of an abscess extending intracranially. He's using an endos, rather an exoscope mounted on an articulating arm. And he's able to use full PPE, face shield, goggles, as well as prescription eyeglasses, which would be almost impossible to do using a traditional binocular microscope. We published a recent study in ONN that looked at the demonstration and mitigation of aerosol and particle dispersion during mastoidectomy relevant to the COVID-19 era. And so to briefly summarize, we introduced uh, fluorescein irrigation fluid into fresh human cadaveric um, heads. We performed a cortical mastoidectomy with and without a microscope and with and without a barrier shield to be able to understand and quantify the dispersion of fluorescein tagged irrigation debris in the field. And we determined that more than 99% of the particles that we saw were between 100 micrometers and one millimeter in size. And so large droplet splatter, we believe from mastoidectomy can be mitigated by simple barrier drape. And so again, using a fluorescein droplet aerosolized model of cadaveric dissection of the mastoid, we then did the study with and without this simple makeshift barrier drape that we call the Ototent 1.0. And then we generated heat maps to try to quantify the degree of spread. And so this is no microscope, with microscope and microscope with ototent. 
And so we thought that the microscope would provide a partial barrier, but it really does not. So using the microscope alone is not enough, not sufficient enough to be able to significantly reduce droplet dispersion. But using the microscope with an ODA tent, a simple makeshift barrier tent, is able to significantly reduce the dispersion of larger droplets. However, airborne aerosols are likely not um, um, protected and not um, stopped by a simple barrier tent. And so we have another series of studies that have formed the basis of a paper that's now under review in which we do quantify the degree of small droplet aerosols and comparing the dispersion with a traditional uh, makeshift tent with a customized tent that can better isolate the airborne aerosols. And so we look forward to sharing those data um, if and when the paper uh, gets accepted. But this paper in ONN is now in press and I believe is uh, now available for review on the ONN website. And so to conclude, I would say that the main advantages of endoscopy or surgery are superior visualization of the middle ear using a transcanal approach. You get a, a great wide field view and a greater depth of field. Main disadvantages of endoscopic ear surgery, one-handed dissection, a 2D view, but very challenging to learn. And so uh, certainly begin your forays with endoscopic uh, dissection slowly and carefully and use a combination of microscopic and endoscopic techniques at the beginning so you don't waste time and prolong your otherwise routine otologic procedures. Another advantage of endoscopic and endoscopic surgery in otology and neurotology, of course, that ergonomics certainly are much better. And uh, my prediction is that heads-up surgery will replace all microscopes to be able to enhance surgeon safety and patient safety using endoscopes for small surgical corridors and exoscopes for open surgical corridors. And finally, re relevant to the pandemic, another very, very clear advantage of heads-up operations in otology and neurotology is that one can more easily use full PPE without obscuring uh, your view. The full PPE is not comfortable. We've all experienced that using N95s and goggles, but uh, using a microscope with full barrier shields can be extremely difficult. And so I believe that a heads-up approach can help to overcome uh, the challenges using full PPE in those cases of COVID positive or COVID at risk patients who undergo otologic procedures. And finally, a barrier shield or even a simple OTA tent can be used with exoscopes as well as microscopes to be able to reduce risk to surgeon and staff. And we look forward to sharing with you our new data with a customized drape that can help to mitigate aerosol spread during otologic bony dissection. Before I go on, I want to hopefully present a case or two since I have about 10 minutes left or so in this presentation. Let's see here, let's go up to the questions. Um, so any recommendations or issues with light intensity? So for endoscopes, even LED light sources can be warm. And so we usually don't use any more than about 50% light intensity on our light source, whether it's a xenon or LED light source. And in fact, you can go lower than that, even 30%. Questions about trials of multiple exoscopes because of the pandemic. Which ones have you tried and which ones uh, do I favor? I think all of them have great features and all of them have limitations. I'd say that the, um, the exoscopes that you feel most comfortable with are the ones you should consider using. And some surgeons want a lot of uh, technology and I think they're fantastic and they can really enhance a surgical experience. Others are much more simple. And maybe for some practices, a, a simple exoscope with minimal technology may be favored. But again, it's gonna depend on your needs. I would say that I would consider using an exoscope that has a fantastic 2D video image quality. The 3D image quality is variable and it can be pretty good in some of the highest end technologies. However, the 2D experience is just favored in my case. I think I just get a much better visual handle on the details of the dissection. So I would certainly try all of them, understand what the ergonomics are as well as the footprint of your operating room. Some ORs may not be able to accommodate some of the systems, whereas others will because they're larger. And so it also depends on the space that you're gonna be placing your exoscope system in. So Dr. Tellian, uh, nice to hear you via chat. You ask about going back to 2D for complex portions of the dissection. 
No, what I mean is going back to a 2D view using the exascope. And so if we feel that the view is not great with a 2D view with the exascope, we will go back to the traditional binocular microscope. But we generally will do the initial parts of the bony dissection with the 3D video system on. And once they get to the meat of the matter, which is getting the nerve off, getting the facial nerve protected and getting the tumor off safely, I'll switch back to 2D. That 2D view is just crisper and much more detailed. And I feel much more confident of removing it. Plus the plane of dissection is much more limited as well. So you don't really miss the 3D experience uh, as much. And you're using, of course, two hands. And so you're using motion parallax to give your brain a sense of depth perception. Uh, from Dr. Monzel, nice to hear from you. Any problems with healing or conductive hearing loss after full degloving of the malleus? Great question. I thought that there would be issues with the drum not recontacting the entire malleus length. I have not seen that uh, to be the case. I assume that might be an issue, but in speaking to my colleagues in Italy and in the Emirates who've done uh, probably a thousand or more endoscopy ear cases than I've done, uh, they have not seen or published in any outcomes that would suggest that that is an issue. I wanted to finish up and highlight first a case uh, that I did during the pandemic, a 65 year old woman with a left-sided oral fullness as her main uh, symptom. And she was referred in by another colleague, an otologist with persistent uh, symptoms that were not relieved with conservative therapy. She had no tinnitus, no subjective hearing loss and no sense of dizziness or vertigo, otherwise a very healthy woman. She, on hearing testing, was found to have a symmetric, a mild to moderate high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, otherwise unimpressive hearing testing in terms of any asymmetry with reasonable word discrimination scores in both ears and normal tympanometry. This uh, was a series of MRI scans on the left, axial T1 weighted. And this is of course a pre-GAD sequence, making this a post-GAD sequence. And so this appears to show a lesion of the left uh, temporal bone. And uh, to the fellows listening, any thoughts on a differential diagnosis based upon these two MRI sequences? And you can use the chat function to share your responses. So a lesion of the left uh, temporal bone it perhaps resides in an area behind the IAC and behind the vestibular labyrinth. From the same patient, T2 weighted series, axial cut, showing a fluid filled structure, again, behind the vestibular labyrinth and behind the internal auditory canal. And it appears to closely approximate the P fossa dura. So, any thoughts on your differential diagnosis in this patient with fairly benign symptoms, essentially left sided oral fullness and symmetric mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss? On the right is a series axial plane DWI sequence showing no obvious restricted diffusion. Any thoughts on differential? Okay, let's look at the CT scan. Left ear axial series, bony windows, starting from the top going down, superior canal, mastoid. We see a mass that appears to come very close to the descending limb of the superior canal. It appears to partially erode the posterior canal. It extends towards the internal auditory canal, 
comes very close to the ampullated horizontal canal towards the vestibule. So differential diagnosis in this case. What's your lead diagnosis? So an orthotic sac tumor, definitely a possibility. Its location would suggest that. Additional testing, what would you do to assess this patient? She has otherwise normal hearing, except for some mild hearing loss, no vestibular issues at all. She's got a fairly sizable lesion. It's eroding into the otic capsule. Dr. Tellian mentions possible metastatic lesion, also a possibility. It appears to be more cystic rather than solid, but uh, metastatic lesion is still definitely a possibility. I wanted to interrogate the vestibular system. Dr. House mentions cholesterol granuloma, no question, a possibility as well. So additional testing, well, we had the hearing testing. The vestibular lab was shut down, but we could get away with a VEMP test. Um, and so we went ahead and obtained that to interrogate at least the function of the inferior vestibular nerve. And this showed intact CVEMP responses in both the right and the left ear. So at least a portion of the vestibular system appears to not have been directly affected by erosion into the posterior semicircular canal. So based upon the concerns of worsening dizziness, impending dizziness, as well as, of course, the threat to her hearing, which was reasonably good, we elected to take her to the OR during the pandemic for a retrolabyrinthine approach, uh, craniotomy with AVR monitoring. We didn't sacrifice the posterior canal because we were able to use a traditional rhinology endoscope angle to be able to look around the posterior canal and clear disease through our retro labyrinthian craniotomy window. And so we used a 2D exoscope with a holder that was used for the mastoidectomy and craniotomy. And that was done with a barrier drape, a simple barrier drape fitted overlying the exoscope. And then we used a 2D endoscope for one-handed intracranial dissection around the labyrinth to be able to clear any residual disease, and we also sent out frozen section. So I just wanted to show you how this was done. So this is the exoscope mounted on a simple articulating arm that's mounted to the bed frame. This is a left ear. And so we're simply placing a ophthalmologic 1060 drape overlying the exoscope and its arm to be able to create a tent in which one could then do some basic dissection. Uh, this is Vivek Kanamori, who's applying for the Neurotology Fellowship this year. And uh, Divya Shari, a first year fellow, Elliot Coase, our second year fellow. And we're doing now a left sided exoscopic assisted transmaster dissection as part of the retro sigmoid, I'm sorry, retro labyrinthian craniotomy approach. And again, the barrier drape does give us enough volume of space under which we can then use both hands. The surgical scrub is able to go underneath this flap and be able to pass instruments back and forth. So it's not a customized drape, but it's a fairly basic drape that allows, allowed us to reduce some of the large particle dispersion during dissection. And so this is a view with the exoscope, a 2D exoscope in which Vivek is now doing the mastoid dissection to be able to give us exposure we need to then expose the cystic mass which Dr. Chari here is dissecting and removing a portion of for frozen section analysis. We're now in the posterior fossa and uh, we're within the lumen of the cyst itself. Uh, she's then widening the craniotomy exposure behind the posterior canal, horizontal canal, mastoid tegmen. And then we're using an angled endoscope looking behind the posterior canal to be able to clear residual disease towards the internal auditory Canal. And this is a view that would not be uh, available using a trans uh, mastoid microscopic assisted view. And of course, this is the cerebellum. We've removed the dura because the tumor was stuck on dura. And then looking down to the lower cranial nerves, we can beautifully appreciate cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11, a loop of pica to be able to find the chorea plexus in the setting of if you're interested in ever placing an ABI, this is the view that you would certainly obtain. And so a retro labyrinthian approach transmastoid can also be considered in the future 
I believe, for an ABI uh, approach. It's um, something that was proposed in the past, but oftentimes you had to sacrifice the posterior canal to get the view because the posterior canal provides an overhang that does not allow you to be able to see around the corners to be able to appreciate the root entry zones of cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11. And this is a still image taken in which we see in the left ear 9, 10, and 11, a loop of pica, and here is the choroid plexus. And this is the target of where the ABI array normally is placed. And so the frozen section suggested an lymphatic sac tumor, and the permanent sections confirm this diagnosis. And as all of you know, it's an extremely rare condition, felt to be a low grade adenocarcinoma, and oftentimes associated with von Hippel Lindau disease, which has an incidence of about one in 40,000. So, a very interesting case during the pandemic in which we took full advantage of PPE as well as risk mitigation strategies with the barrier drape and using exoscopes to uh, reduce the risk to surgical staff uh, in the operating room.